Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. Uh, I just want to share with you uh, some thoughts on Saint Jerome um, and his views on the canon because um, I had a debate with some Muslims the other day and one of them took, brought up the issue about Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea and basically said that there were hundreds of documents consulted at Nicaea to prove what uh, the Bible was and was not and I refuted that completely as not correct but there was one little quote by Jerome who said the Council of Nicaea accepted uh, a particular book that was not in the New Testament excuse me as scripture so what I wanted to do is just actually let's go and look at more of Jer Jer Saint Jerome let's go and reflect on what he actually thought of the canon and um, so that's going to be really interesting to have a look at what he actually said. So without further ado, um, we shall look at, um, first of all, the life of St. Jerome uh, by the Rel Reverend Alban Butler, uh, 1711 to 73. Uh, the lives of the saints. We'll just get um, a brief outline of Saint Jerome's life. Uh, you can get this on www.bartley.com. Um, Saint Jerome, who is allowed to have been in many respects the most learned of all the Latin fathers, was born at Stringonium, now called Gran, situated upon the Danube in Lower Hungary, but at Strindinium, now Adrigani, a small town upon the confines of Pannonia, Dalmatia, and Italy near Aquilia. He had a brother much younger than himself whose name was Paulinian. His father, called Eusebius, was descended from a good family and had a competent estate, but being persuaded that a good education is the most precious inheritance that a parent can leave to his children, too great care to have his son instructed in piety and in the first, the first principles of literature at home and afterwards sent to Rome. Saint Jerome had therefore uh, tutor the famous pagan grammarian Donatus well known for his commentaries on Virgil and Terence also Victorinus the rhetorician who by a decree of the Senate was honored with a statue in Trajan Square. In this city he became master of the Latin and Greek tongues read the best writers in both languages with great application and made such progress in oratory that he for some time pleaded at the bar but being left without a guide under the discipline of a heathen master in a school where an exterior regard to decency and morals was all that was aimed at he forgot the sentiments of true piety which had been instilled into him in, in his infancy neglected sufficiently to restrain his passions and was full only of worldly views his misfortune confirms the truth of what of that important maxim that though the advantages of emulation and mutual communication in studies be exceeding great with regard to learning these are never to be purchased with danger to virtue nor is a youth to be trusted in public schools with the utmost precaution both that it be under the watchful eye and prudent direction of a person who is sincerely pious and experienced and that he be linked in society with virtuous companions whose gravity, inclinations and discourse and whole deportment and spirit may be to him a constant spur to all virtue and a support and fence against the torrent of the world or of the dangerous examples of others. Jerome went out of this school free indeed from gross vices but unhappily a stranger to a Christian spirit and enslaved to vanity the more refined passions as he afterwards confessed and bitterly lamented. Being arrived at man's estate and various desires of English studies, he resolved upon travelling in order to further the design. Few means contribute more to give a knowledge of men and the world and to enlarge a person's insight in all arts and sciences, in every branch of useful knowledge than travelling in polite and learned countries. But for this, a maturity of age and judgment is requisite. A foundation must have been first laid of competent stock of knowledge at least of the principles of all the arts in which a person seeks to improve himself 
Otherwise, things will present to him only those surfaces or shells he will see and hear without understanding, and his travels will at least be no more than an idle gratification of vain curiosity. The conversation of the wisest and best persons in every place is to be cultivated. The snares of the world and all bad company must be watchfully guarded against, and whatever can be any improvement in valuable knowledge must be diligently treasured up, in which even those who are best qualified qualified for making proper observations will still find pleasure and great advantage by a guide who is ready and able to point out whatever deserves notice and to improve and be himself improved by mutual observations. Virtue being the greatest and most noble of all improvements of the human mind challenges the first attention of the traveller who will be able everywhere to meet with lessons of it in the example, maxims and instructions of the good and to learn watchfulness even from the snares of vice, heroic practices and sentiments of piety, how much soever they are concealed may be learned almost everywhere. If conversation with the most experienced persons in virtue be sought to the Spirit of God inspire an earnest desire of making such discoveries and improvements. Above all things in travelling great fervour and assiduity in all religious exercise is necessary, and frequent meditation must cherish the maintain impious sentiments and serious reflections digest all the improvements of the mind. Personal duties and circumstances allow few the opportunity of travelling and either by too much time or wrong season of life or are neglected of the necessary rules and conditions. It generally becomes a vicious rambling and a school of sloth trifling and often of all passions. Most travel so as to unhinge the whole frame of their minds by living in constant dissipation so as to verify the motto that few become by, become by it more holy. As for modish modern travellers whose chief study is the gratification of their passions, the import home little less but the slanders and impiety of foreign cities and the vices of the most abandoned rakes into whose company they most easily fall and the countries through which they passed. Many ancient philosophers travelled for the sake of acquiring useful science, fervent servants of God, have sometimes left their cells, though redoubling their ardour in the practice of penance and recollection, recollection to visit holy men for their own edification and instruction. Saint Jerome, in his first journey, was conducted by the divine mercy into the paths of virtue and salvation. A vehement thirst after learning put him upon making the tour through Gaul where the Romans had erected several famous schools, especially at Marseilles, Toulouse and Bordeaux, or to Lyons and Trias. This later was esteemed an imperial city, being at the, in that age frequently honoured with the presence of the emperors, when Rome, by the attachment of many powerful senators to idolatry, and their regret for the loss of their ancient liberty and privilege, privileges was not so agreeable to residents to its princes. The Emperor Gratian, a learned man and a great lover of learning, who appointed out of his own revenue fixed salaries for the public masters of rhetoric and of the Greek and Latin in all great cities, distinguished the schools of Gaul with special favours, and above the rest those of Trias, to whose professors he granted greater salaries than to those of other cities, and whither he drew Osinius from Bordeaux. By prudent regulations, he forbade the students of the city to frequent public diversions or shows in the theatre, or to assist at great banquets or entertainments, and gave other strict orders for the regulations of their manners. Asinius extols the eloquence and learning of the illustrious Harmonius Ursulus, professor of eloquence at Trias. It had been St. Jerome's greatest pleasure at Rome to collect a good library and to read all the best authors. In this, such was his passion that it made him sometimes forget to eat or drink. Cicero, Plautus were his chief delight. He purchased a great many books, copied several, and procured many to be transcribed by his friends. He arrived at Trias with his friend Bonsonus not long before the year 370, and it was in that city that the sentiments of piety which he imbibed in his infancy were awakened, and his heart was entirely converted to God, so that renouncing the vanity of his former pursuits, and the irregularities of his life, he took a resolution to devote himself wholly to the divine service in a state of perpetual continence. 
of this time his ardour for virtue far surpassed that which he had before applied himself to profane sciences and he converted the course of his studies into a new channel being still still intent on enriching his library he copied at trees St. Hilary's book on the Synods and his commentaries on the Psalms having collected whatever he could meet with in Gaul to augment his literary treasure he repaired to Aquilia where at that time flourished many eminent and learned men St. Valerian the bishop had entirely cleared the church of Iranianism which it had been infected under his predecessor and had drawn thither so many virtuous and learned men that the clergy of Aquilia were famous over all the western church Many of these St. Jerome contracted so great an intimacy that their names appear often in his writings. Among these, St. Chromatius, who was the priest, succeeded St. Valerian in the episcopal dignity, whose death happened in 387 on the 26th of November, as Fotina, um, Fotanina uh, demonstrates. To St. Chromatius, St. Jerome afterwards dedicated several of his works. This great bishop died on the 2nd of December, about the year 406 AD. Among other eminent clergymen of Aquilia at the time, I reckoned St. Chromatius' two brothers, Jovinus the Archdeacon and Eusebius Deacon Hilodorus, who was ordained bishop of Antino before the death of St. Valerian, and his nephew Nipotation and Nicetus, Subdeacon and Chris Gornus, a monk. It appears from the chronicle and letters of St. Jerome that Helodorus, Neptotian, and Nicetus and Flor Florentius were also monks. The monastic state had been introduced in Italy by St. Athanasius during his exile there, as St. Jerome testifies. Cardinal Norris observes that he made a long stay at Aquilia by that great saint's account of the lives of St. Anthony and other monks in Egypt, many were excited to imitate them, and a great monastery was founded in Aquilia, which learned Fatinia calls the first in Italy, though others think St. Eusebius of Vesilia, upon his return from the east, had built one in his own city before this. Others were soon after erected at Rome, Milan, and other places. When St. Athanasius committed writing the life of St. Anthony, he mentions that there were then several monasteries in Italy. Trainius Rufinus, famous first for his friendship and afterwards for his controversies with St. Jerome, entered himself as monk of Aquilia in 370 AD, as is clear both from his own and St. Jerome's works. He was a native of Concordia, not the city of that name near Mandola, but a small town in the territory of Aquilia, where during the residence of St. Jerome in that city, he was baptized in the great church by St. Valerian, St. Chromatius and Jovinus and Eusebius assisting, whom on this account Rufinus afterwards calls his three fathers or sponsors, one being sponsor at catechism, another at baptism and a third at confirmation. This testimony confutes the mistake of Don Martin and Gerard Maestrich who imagine that anciently no than one sponsor was ever admitted for the same person. St. Jerome shut himself up in this monastery at Aquilia for some time, did he might with greater leisure and freedom pursue his studies, at the course of which he was closely linked in friendship with Rufinus, and with, gr with great grief saw himself by some unknown accident torn from his company. From that quarter his storm arose is uncertain, though it seems to have come from his own family, for he mentions that paying his friend a visit, he found his sister had been drawn aside from the path of virtue, he brought her to a deep sense of her duty and engaged her to make a vow of perpetual continency in which affair he probably met with those difficulties which had obliged him for the sake of his own peace to leave the country his aunt Costrina at the same time vowed her continency to God. Saint Jerome returned to resolve to betake himself wholly to his studies and retirement. In his letter to Pope uh, Damasus, he testified that he received at Rome the sacraments of regeneration. Tillamon thinks this happened after his return from Aquilia because the saint tells us that his merciful conversion, conversation to God happened when he resides near the Rhine. 
but Matani and Fatina more probably maintain that he was baptized before he left Rome uh, to go into Gaul. Though it was only at Trias that he engaged himself by a vow to serve God in a state of perpetual constancy. Experience soon convinced him that neither his own country nor Rome were fit places for a life of perfect solitude, at which he aimed, wherefore he resolved to withdraw into some distant country. Bonossus, his countryman and relation who had been the companion of all his studies and travels from his infancy, did not enter into his views on this occasion, but retired into a desert island on the coast uh, of Dalmatia, and there led a monastic life. Evagrius, the celebrated priest of Antioch, who was coming to the west upon the affairs of that church, offered himself to our saint to be his guide in the east. And innocent Helodiorus and Hylas, who had been a servant of Melania, would need bearing company. They crossed Thrace, Pontus, Bithynia, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Cilicia. Where he came, he visited. Wherever he came, he visited the and Corrette's and other persons of eminent sanctity, whose conversation might afford him instruction and edification. At that time, many such flourished in the East, especially in the deserts of Egypt, Syria, and Palestine. Rufinus names among those who blessed him. He received in Egypt the two Macrisius, Isidore in Seat, uh, Pambo in the cells, Pullman and Joseph in Pisphere on the mountain, of Antony, St. John reckons among them Amos, Macarius, the disciple of Antony, and amongst other holy rules which they observed, he takes notice in his letter to Rusticus that the monasteries of Egypt were wont to admit none who did not follow some manual labor, not so much for the necessity of the sustenance as for the sanctification of their souls. Being arrived at Antioch, St. Jerome made some stay in the city to attend the lectures of Apollinar um, Apollinaris who had not yet openly broached his heresy, and then read comments upon the scriptures with great reputation. St. Jerome had carried nothing with him but his library and a sum of money to bear the charges of his journey. But Evagrius, who was rich, supplied him with all necessities and maintained several amanuenses to write for him and assist him in his studies. The saint, having spent some time at Antioch, went into a hit desert lying between Syria and Arabia in the country of, of the Sarsians, where the holy abbot Theodosius received him with great joy. This wilderness took its name from the Chalcis, a town in Syria, and was situated in the diocese of Antioch. Innocents and Hylias soon died in this desert, and Hilodrus left it to return into the west. But Jerome spent there four years in studies and the fervent exercise of piety in this lonely habitation. He had many fits of sickness, but suffered a much more severe affliction from violent temptations of impurity, which is, he describes as follows, quote, St. Jerome, in the most remotest part of a wild and sharp desert, which being burned up with the heat of the scorching sun, sun strikes with horror and terror even the monks who inhabit it. I seem to myself to be in the midst of the delights and assemblies of Rome. I love solitude, that in the bitterness of my soul I might more freely bewail my miseries and call upon my Saviour. My hideous, emaciated limbs were covered with sackcloth, my skin was parched dry and black, and my flesh was almost wasted away. The days I passed in tears and groans when sleep overpowered me against my will. I cast my weary bones, which hardly hung together, upon the bare ground not so properly to give them rest as to torture myself. I say nothing of my eating and drinking. For the fear of hell I involuntarily condemn myself, having no other company but scorpions and wild beasts. I many times find my imagination filled... Sorry about this. Hello? Hi Dave, you okay bro? Yeah, I'm okay, mate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mate. Yeah. All right, Dave. Thanks a lot, mate. All right. Thanks a lot, bro. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Sorry about that. I many times find my imagination filled, says Saint Jerome, with lively representations of dancers in the company of Roman ladies. As if I had been in the midst of them, my face was pale with fasting, yet my will felt violent assaults of irregular desires. In my cold body and in my parched up flesh, which seemed dead before its death, conspic conspic concu uh, sorry, concu uh, Pissence was able to live, and though I vigorously repressed all its sallies, it strove always to rise again, to cast forth more violent and dangerous flames. Finding myself abandoned, as it were, to the power of this enemy, I threw myself in spirit at the feet of Jesus, watering them with my tears and tearing my flesh by the fasting whole weeks. I am not ashamed to disclose my temptations, but I grieve that I am not now what I then was. I often joined all nights to the days, crying, sighing, beating my breast till the desired calm returned. I feared the very cell in which I lived because it was witness to the foul suggestions of my enemy, and being angry and armed with severity against myself, I went alone into the most secret parts of the wilderness, and if I discovered anywhere a deep valley or craggy rock that was the place of my prayer, why I threw this miserable sack of my body, the same Lord is my witness that after so many sobs and tears, after Having in much sorrow looked long up to heaven, I felt most delightful comforts and interior sweetness, and these so grew great that transporting them, I seemed to myself to be amidst the choirs of angels. Amen. <clears throat> In this manner does God, who often suffers the fidelity of his servants, says the writer about Jerome, be sincerely tried, strengthen them by his triumphant grace, and abundantly recompense their constancy. Saint Jerome, among the arms which he fortified himself against this dangerous enemy, added to his corporal austerities a new study which he hoped would fix his rambling imagination, and by curbing his will give him the victory over himself. This was after after dealt only in polite and agreeable studies to learn of a converted Jew the Hebrew alphabet, and from his mouth to the uncouth aspirations and difficult pronunciations of that language. When my soul was on fire with bad, says he, writing to the monk Rusticus, that I might subdue my flesh, I became a scholar to a monk who had been a Jew, to learn of him the Hebrew alphabet, and after I had most diligently studied the judicious rules of Quintilian, the, cop the copious flowing eloquence of Cicero, and the grave style of Fronto, and the smoothness of Pliny, I injured myself to hissing of broken wind, winded words, what labour it cost me, what difficulties I went through, how often I despaired and left off, how I began again to learn both myself who felt the burden, can witness that the also who lived with me, and I thank our Lord that I now gather sweet fruit from the bitter seed of those studies. However, he still continued to read the classics with an eagerness and pleasure, which degenerated into passion and gave him just remorse, it being an impediment to the perfect disenchantment of his affections and the entire reign of God in his heart. Of this, this, this disorder he was cured by the merciful hand of God. The saint in his long epistle to uh, Eusticum exalting that virgin who had embraced a religious state to read only the Holy Scriptures and other books of piety and devotion Place that being seized with grievous sickness in the desert in the heat of a burning fever, he fell into a trance or dream in which he seemed to himself arraigned before the dreadful tribunal of Christ. Being asked his profession, he answered that he was a Christian. Thou liest, says the judge, thou art Ciceronian for the works of that author possesseth thy heart. The judge thereupon condemned him to be severely scourged by angels the remembrance of which chastisement left a strong impression upon his imagination after his recovery and gave him deep sense of his fault. He promised the judge never more to read those profane authors and from that time, says he, I gave myself to the reading of divine things with greater diligence and attention than I had ever read other authors. He indeed declares this to have been a dream, nevertheless be looked upon it as divine adomination admonishment, by which he was put in mind of a fault incompatible with the perfection which every Christian, especially a monk, ought to aspire. From that time he corrected this immoderate passion for reading the classics, 
Besides interior trials and temptations, St. Jerome met with many persecutions from the world, of which he writes as follows, Would to God that all the infidels would rise up together against me for having defended the glory in the name of the Lord. I wish that the whole world would conspire in blaming my conduct, that I may by this means obtain the appropriation of Jesus Christ. You are deceived if you think that a Christian can live without persecution. He suffers the greatest who lives under none. Nothing is more to be feared than to too long a peace. A storm puts a man upon his guard and obliges him to ex exert his utmost efforts to escape shipwreck. A great schism at that time divided the Church of Antioch. Some acknowledging Meltius and others Paulinus, Patriarch. The breach was considerably widened when the Apollinarist heretic chose uh, Vitellus, a man of the sect, bishop of that great city. The monks in the desert of Chalcis warmly were to part in this unhappy division and were for compelling St. Jerome to declare which of these candidates he adhered. Another controversy among them was whether one or three hypostases were to be acknowledged in Christ. The Greek word hypostasis was then ambiguous being by some used for nature, by others for person or substance, though it is now taken only for the later. The Arians on one side and the Sabalians on the other sought to ensnare the faithful under the ambiguity, ambiguity of this word. Other saints, therefore, stood upon his guard against their captioned artifices and answered with caution that if nature was understood by this word, there was but one God, but in person then there were three. Teased, however, by these importunities and afflicted with a bad state of health, he left his wilderness, having passed in it for four years, and went to Antioch, Antioch to his friend Avagarius. A little before he left his desert, he wrote two letters to consult St. Demesis, who had been raised to the papal throne at Rome in 366. What course he ought to steer? In the first he says, I am joined in communion with your holiness, that is, with the chair of Peter. Upon that rock I know the church is built. Whoever eats the lamb out of that house is a profane person. Whoever is not in the ark shall perish in the flood. I do not know Vitalis. I do not communicate with Meletius. Paulinus is a stranger to me. Paulinus is a stranger to me. Whoever gathers not with you scatters. That is, he who is not Christ this belongs to Antichrist. We add this word, hypostasis, signifies, they say, a subsisting person. We answer that if that be the meaning of the word, we agree to it. Order me, if you please, what I should do. This letter was written towards the end of the year 376, or in the beginning of 377. The saint, not receiving a speedy answer, sent soon after another letter to Damasus on the same subject, in which he conjures his holiness to answer his difficulties and not despise a soul for which Jesus Christ died. Of one side, said he, the Iranian Arian fury rages supported by the secular power, on the other side, the church at Antioch being divided into three parts, each would needs draw me to itself. All the time I cease not to cry out. Whoever is united to the chair of Peter is mine. The answer of Damasus is not extant, but it is certain that he and all the West acknowledged Paulinus patriarch of Antioch, and St. John received from his hand at Antioch the holy order of priesthood before the end of the year 377 to which promotion he only consented on this condition that he should not be obliged to serve that or any other church in the function of his ministry. Soon after his ordination, he went into Palestine and visited the principal holy places situated in different parts of the country, but made Bethlehem his most usual residence. He had recourse to the ablest Jewish doctors to inform himself of all particulars relating to the remarkable places mentioned in sacred history and he neglected, neglected no means to perfect himself with the knowledge of the Hebrew tongue. For this he addressed himself to the most skillful among the Jews, one of his masters by whose instruction he exceedingly improved himself, spoke Hebrew with such gracefulness, true accent and propriety of expression that he passed among the Jewish doctors of a true Chaldean. About the year 380, our saint went to Constantinople, there to study the whole scriptures under Saint Gregory and uh, Nazanzen, who was the bishop of that city. Several parts of his works he mentioned with this singular satisfaction and gratitude for the honour and happiness of having had so great a master in expanding the divine oracle. 
as the most eloquent and learned doctor. Upon St. Gregory's leaving Constantinople, in 381 he returned to Palestine not long after he was called to Rome. He went thither in the year 381 with St. Paulinus of Antioch and St. Epiphanius, who undertook that journey to attend the council which Damasus held about the Chism, Schism of Antioch. The two bishops stayed with the winter in Rome and then returned into the east, but Pope Damasus detained St. Jerome with him and employed him as his secretary in writing his letters in answering the consultations of bishops and in other important affairs in the church. Our holy doctor soon gained at Rome a universal love and esteem on account of his religious life, his humility, eloquence and learning. Many among the chief nobility, clergy and monks sought to be instructed by him in the holy scriptures and in the rules of Christian perfection. He was charged likewise with the conduct of many devout ladies at St. Marcella, her sister um, Asila, and their mother Albina. Uh, Melania, the elder who is not less famous by the praise of St. Jerome, than by those of Rufinus, uh, Marcellina, Felicitas, Leah, uh, Fabolia, Letty, Paula, and her daughters, with many others. The holy widow, St. Marcella, having lost her husband in the seventh month after her marriage, refused to, refused to marry uh, Carilius, who had been consul, retired to a country house near Rome, and made choice of a monastic life forty years before this, in 341 under Pope Julius I when St. Athanasius came to Rome, for whom she received an account of the life of St. Anthony, who was the living. She was instructed by St. Jerome in the critical learning of the Holy Scriptures, in which he made great progress and learned in a short time many things which had cost him abundance of labor. St. Jerome, in one letter, explains to her the ten Hebrew names of God and the Hebrew words which are adopted in the church office. In another, he explains the ephod, the teraphim, and so in another, St. Marcella died in 412, and St. Jerome wrote her funeral elegy to a spiritual daughter, Principia. Principia. Leah was at the head of the monastery of virgins, who she instructed more by example than by words. She used to spend whole nights in prayer. Her clothes and food were very mean, but free from all affection or ostentation. She was so humble that she appeared to be the servant of all her sisters, though she had formerly been mistress of a great number of slaves. The church honours her memory in the 22nd of March, St. Jerome wrote her funeral elegy after her death in 384. Asili was consecrated to God at the age of 10 years and at 12 retired into a cell where she lay on the ground and lived upon bread and water fasting all the year and being often two or three days without eating especially in Lent yet her austerities did not impair her health. She used to work with her hands and she never went abroad unless it was to visit the churches of the martyrs that she did without being seen. Nothing was more cheerful and pleasing than her severity, nor more grave than her sweetness. Her very speech proclaimed the love of recollection and silence, and her silence spoke aloud to the heart. She never spoke to any man unless upon her spiritual necessities. Even her sister Marcella could hardly ever see her. Her conduct was simple, regular, and in the midst of Rome she led a life of solitude. She was 50 years old in 384, Fabelia was of the illustrious Fabian family, and being obliged to be separated from her husband on account of his disorderly conduct, made use of the liberty allowed her by the civil laws, and took a second husband. After his death, finding this was against the law of the gospel, she did public penance in the most austere and exemplary manner. After this, she sold all her estate and erected an hospital for the sick in Rome, where she served them with her own hands. She gave immense alms to several monasteries which were built upon the course of Tuscany and to the poor in Italy and Palestine. She died at Rome about the year 400. The most illustrious of the Roman ladies whom St. Jerome instructed once St. Paula, who engaged him to accept of a lodging in her house during his abode in Rome, that she and her family might more easily have recourse to him for their spiritual direction. He tells us that Marcella, Paula, Basilla, and Ustchium uh, spoke, wrote, and recited the Psalmster in Hebrew as perfectly as the Greek and Latin tongues. The instructions of these and many other devout persons did not so engross our saints' time and attention, but he was always ready to acquit himself of all that Pope Damascus recommended to his care, and by the labours to render important service to the Catholic Church. Pope Damas Damasus died in December 384 and was succeeded by Sericius, the freedom which St. Jerome took in reproving reigning vices of avarice, vanity, and 
efficacy, which in effectiveness several among the clergy took themselves, raised in many powerful enemies. The authority of Pope Damas has kept them in awe so long as he lived, but after his death, envy were let loose upon our saint. His reputation was attacked in the most outrageous manner. Even his simplicity, his manner of walking, his smiling, and the air of his countenance were found fault with. Neither did the severe and eminent virtue of the ladies who were under his direction, nor the reservedness of his own behaviour screen him from censure. St. Jerome partly to yield to this persecution of envy and partly to follow his own strong inclination to solitude after having stayed about the years at Rome, resolved to return into the east. There to seek a quiet retreat, he embarked at Porto in the month of August in 385, and his young brother uh, Paulinian, a priest called Vincent, and some others having been attended from Rome to the ship by many pious persons of distinction, landing at Cyprus, he was received with great joy by St. Epiphanius at Antioch. He visited the bishop uh, Paulinius, who he departed, attended him considerable part of the way to Palestine. He arrived at Jerusalem in the middle of the winter, near the close of the year 385. In the following spring, went into Egypt to improve himself in sacred learning and in the most perfect practice of the monastic institute. At Alexandria, he for a month received the lessons of the famous uh, Did, uh, Didymus and profited very much by his conversation in 386. He visited the chief monasteries of Egypt, of which he returned to Palestine and retired to Bethlehem. St. Paul, who had followed him thither, built for him a monastery and put under his direction also the monastery of nuns, which he founded and governed. St. Jerome was soon obliged to enlarge his own monastery and for that purpose sent his brother uh, Paulinian into Dalmatia to sell an estate which he still had there. For as Sanchez and Suarez remarked from this example, anciently private religious men could retain the dominion or property in a state, though by their vows they renounced the administration unless they exercise it by the commission of the abbot. St. Jerome also erected an hospital in which he entertained pilgrims. It was thought that he could not be further instructed in the knowledge of the Hebrew language, but this was not his own judgment of the matter, and he applied again to the famous Jewish master called Bar Ananias, who for a sum of money came to teach him in the night time, lest the Jews would, should know it. Church history which is called one of the eyes of the Jew, became a favorite study of our holy doctor. All the heresies which were broached in the church in this time found him a warm and inf indefatigable adversary. Whilst he was an inhabitant of the desert of Chalcius, he drew his pen against the Luciferian sch schismatics. After the unhappy council of Rimini, in which many orthodox bishops had been betrayed, contrary to their meaning into subscription favorable to the Arians, St. Athanasius in his council at Alexander in 362 and other Catholic prelates came to a resolution to admit those, admit those prelates to communion upon their repentance. This indulgence displeased Lucifer, Bishop of Cagliari, a person famous for his zeal and writing against the Arians in the reign of Continentius, Constan, uh, Constantius. He likewise took offend the Oriental Catholic bishops, refusing to hold communion with Paulinius, whom with his own hands he had consecrated bishop of Antioch in the place of St. Eustathius. He carried matters so far as to separate himself from the communion of all those who admitted the bishops who had subscribed to the Council of Rimini, even after they had made a reasonable satisfaction. The, excuse me. This gave rise to his schism, in which he had some few followers at Antioch, in Sardinia and in Spain. He is not accused of any error in faith. Leaving Antioch, where he had sown the first seeds of his schism, he returned to Sardinia and died in uh, Cagliaria nine years after in 371. Saint Jerome composed a dialogue against the Luciferians in which he plainly demonstrates by the acts of the Council of Rimini that in the bishops were imposed upon. In the same work he confutes the private heresy of Hilary, a Lucifer deacon at Rome, that the Arians and all the heretics and schismatics will be rebaptized, on which accounts of Saint Jerome calls him the Duclean of the world. 
Our holy doctor, whilst he resided at Rome in the time of Pope Damasus uh, in 384, composed his book against Helevedius, or the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. That heretic was an avian priest, a disciple of the impious Oxentius of Milan, and had wrote a book in which he broached this error that Mary did not always remain a virgin, but had other children by St. Joseph after the birth of Christ. His heresy was also adopted by Jovinian, who having spent his youth at Milan in fasting, manual labour, and other austerities of monastic state, left his monastery, went to Rome, and there began to spread his errors, which may be chiefly reduced to these four, that they who are generated by baptism with perfect faith cannot be again vanquished by the devil, that all who shall have preserved the grace of baptism will have an equal reward in heaven, that virgins have no greater merit before God than married women if they are equal in other virtues, and that the mother of God was not always a virgin, lastly, that abstinence from certain meats is unprofitable, and Jovian lived at Rome in a manner suitable to his sensual principles. Though he still called himself a monk and observed celibacy, he threw off his black habit, wore fine white stuffs, linen, and silks, curled his hair, frequented the baths and houses of entertainment, and was found fond of sumptuous feasts and delicate wines. St. Pancius and certain other noble laymen were scandalized at his new doctrine, and having met with the writing of Jovanian in which these errors were contained, carried it to Pope Sersidius, who, assembling his clergy in 390, condemned the same and cut off Jovi to others who were named altogether as authors of this new heresy from the communion of the church. Upon this, Jovian and the rest who were condemned withdrew to Milan, and Sersius sent thither the sentence of condemnation, he had published against them with a brief confutation of their errors, so that they were rejected there by everybody with horror driven out of the city. St. Ambrose also had a council of seven bishops who happened then to be at Milan, in which these errors were again condemned. Two years after this, St. Jerome wrote two books against Jovinian, and the first he shows the merit and excellency of holy virginity embraced for the sake of virtue which he demonstrates from St. Paul and other parts of the New Testament, from the tradition and sense of the Church, from the celibacy of its masters, and from the advantage of this state of piety, especially for the exercise of prayer, though he grants marriage to be holy in the general state of the world. Giovanni himself confessed the obligation of bishops to live content, and that a violation of a vow of virginity is a spiritual incest. Our saint in his second book confutes the other errors of the Hersiarch, certain expressions in this work seem to some persons in Rome harsh, derogative from the honour due to matrimony, and St. Pacius informed St. Jerome of the offence which some took at them. The holy doctor wrote his apology to, pa uh, to Pamacius, sometimes called his third book against Jovian, in which he shows from his own book which had raised this clamour that he com commended marriage as honourable and holy and protest that he condemns not even second and third marriages. He repeated the same thing in a letter which he wrote to Min D Dominio about the same time and upon the same subject. In the year 404, Riparius, a priest in Spain, wrote to St. Jerome to acquaint him that uh, Vigilantius, a native of Convene, uh, Convenia, now called Cominges in Gaul, but a priest of Barcelona depreciated the merit of holy virginity and condemned the veneration of relics, calling those who paid it idolaters and cenarians or worshippers of ashes, ashes, ashes. Sorry about this. Sorry. Saint Jerome, in his answer, exclaimed loudly against the novelties and said, "We do not adore the relics of the martyrs, but we honour them that we may adore whose martyrs they are." We honour the servants that the respect which is paid to them may be reflected back on the Lord. He prayed Reparius to send him Vigilantius' book, which he no sooner received than he set himself to confute it in a very sharp style. He shows ver first the excellency of virginity and the celibacy of the clergy on the dis discipline observed in the three patriarchs of Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome. He vindicates the honour paid to martyrs from idolatry because no Christian ever adored them as gods. 
The Galentius complained that their relics were covered with precious silk. St. Jerome asked him if Constantin Constantius was guilty of sacrilege when he tran translated to Constantinople in rich shrines the relics of Andrew, Luke and Timothy in the presence of which the evil spirits roar or Arcadius when he caused the bones of Samuel to be carried out of Palestine to Thrace where they were deposited with the greatest honour and solemnity in a church built in honour of that prophet near Hebdomen. In order to show that the saints pray for us, St. Jerome said, if the apostles and martyrs being still living upon earth can pray for other men, how much more may they do it after their victories? Have they less power now than they are with Jesus Christ? He insists much on the miracle in the tombs. Vigilantia said they were for the sake of the infidels. The holy doctors answered they would still be no less a proof of the power of the martyrs and testifying his respect for these relics and holy places he says of himself, excuse me, when I have been molested with anger, evil thoughts and nocturnal illusions, I have not dared to enter the churches of the martyrs. He mentions that the bishops of Rome offered up sacrifices to God over the venerable bones of the Apostle Peter and Paul and made altars of their tombs. He accuses Unimus of being the author of this heresy and says that if this new doctrine were true, all the bishops in the world be in error. He defends the institution of vigils and the monastic state and says that a monk seeks his own security by flying occasions and dangers because he mistrusts, mistrusts his own weakness and is sensible that there is no safety of a man sleep near a serpent. St. Jerome often speaks of the saints in praying for us, thus he entreated Elodorus to pray for him when he should be in glory, and told St. Paul upon the death of her daughter, Vessel, she now prayeth the Lord for you, and obtaineth for me the pardon of my sins. So um, we've gone considerable, quite a lot, into the life of Jerome, and still we're only... Uh, a quarter way through um, I find it fascinating uh, this life of Jerome and I'm finding it really uh, interesting when we get to the end of the life of Jerome we'll then look at his views on the canon Butler goes on to write about Jerome our saints was also engaged in a long long war against Origenism Few ever made more use of Origen's works, and no one seemed a greater admirer in warmly opposing the spreading evil. This produced a violent quarrel between him and his old friend Rufinius after an intimacy of 25 years. The later ever were extolling the authority of Origen, and having translated into Latin most, the most erroneous of all his works, though it afterwards appeared by his conduct that he had not designed to favour the pestilential heresies of the Origenists, who denied the eternity of the torments of hell, held the pre-existence of souls, the plurality of worlds succeeding one another to eternity, and other errors. Saint Jerome could suffer no heresy to pass without his censure, being informed by uh, Tesiphon and the errors of Pelagius made great progress in the East and that many were seduced by them. He wrote to him a short confutation thereof in 1414. He again handled the same question in his dialogue against the Pelagians which he published in Alark in 410, and the cruel famine which succeeded that calamity. Many Romans fled as far as Bethlehem, and it was the charitable employment of our saint to entertain them and give them all possible succor and comfort. He was shocked at the sight of such a number of noble fugitives of both sexes, reduced at once to beggary after possessing immense riches, now seeking food and shelter, naked and wounded, and still as they wandered about exposed to the insults of barbarians, we thought them loaded with gold, all these miseries forced tears from the saint's eyes whilst he was endeavouring to find means to assist them. When Demetrius, daughter of the consul Olabrius, took the religious veil at Carthage, 
her mother Juliana and her grandmother Probe wrote to Jerome praying him to give her some instructions for her conduct. In order to comply with the request, he wrote her a long letter in which he directed her how she was to serve God, recommended to her a pious reading, the exercise of penance and constant, constant but moderate fasting of obedience and humility, modesty, alms deeds and prayer at all hours of the day, and working daily with her hands, he would have her rather choose to dwell in a nunnery with her other virgins than to live alone as at that time some did. Nothing has rendered the name of Saint Jerome so famous as his critical labours on the Holy Scriptures. For this the Church acknowledges him, acknowledges him to have been raised by God through a special providence, and particularly assisted from above, and she styles him the greatest of all her doctors in, in its expanded the Divine Oracles. Pope Clement the Eighth scruples not to call him a man in translating the Holy Scriptures divinely assisted and inspired. He was furnished with the greatest helps for such an undertaking. Great distance of place and time as the multitude of lizards and many other circumstances which still occur in the country where Virgil wrote his bucolics, paint a lively image of his beauty, uh, similes and allusions so that the eye almost to behold the objects and the other senses are in like manner struck with them, almost as if they were present. The Greek and Chaldaic were the living language and the Hebrew, though it had ceased to be such from the time of the captivity, was no less perfectly understood and spoken among the doctors of the law in its full extent and with true pronunciation. It was carefully cultivated in the Jewish Academy uh, or great school of Tiberius, out of which St. Jerome had a master. It has long since become very imperfect, reduced to a small number of radical words, and only to be learned from Hebrew Bible, the only ancient book in the world extant in that language. Most of the rabbinical writers are more likely to mislead us in the study of Hebrew sacred texts than to direct us in it, so that we have now no means to come at many at many succour which St. Jerome had for this task. Among others, the Hexpler of origin, which he possessed pure and entire, were not the least, and by comparing his version with the present remains of those of Aquila, Asia, and Semechus, we find he had often recourse to them, especially so that of um, Symmachus. Above other conditions, it is necessary that an interpreter of Holy Scripture be a man of prayer and sincere piety. This alone can obtain light and succour from heaven. Give to the mind a turn temper which are necessary for being admitted into the sanctuary of the divine oracles and present the key. Our holy doctor was prepared by a great purity of heart and life spent in penance and holy contemplation before he was called by God to this important undertaking. A Latin translation of the Bible was made from the Greek in the time of the Apostles and probably approved or recommended by some of them, especially according to Rufinius by St. Peter, who, as he says, sat 25 years at Rome. That it was the work of several hands is proved by Mr. Miles, who during the space of 30 years examined all the editions and versions of the sacred tracts with, with great application by Calment and Blancini, uh, Blancini in the 4th century, great variations had crept into the copies, as St. Jerome mentioned, so that almost everyone differed. For many that understood Greek undertook to translate anew some part or to make some alterations from the original. original. However, as Blanchini observes, these alterations seem to have been all grafted upon or inserted in the first translation. Well, they seem to all have gone under the name of the Latin Vulgate or common translation. Amongst them, one obtained name of the Italic pass because it was chiefly used in Italy and Rome, and this was by far preferable to all the other Latin editions. As St. Austin testifies, to remedy this inconvenience of this variety of editions and to correct the faults of the bold or careless copiers, Pope Damasus commissioned St. Jerome to revise and correct the Latin version of the Gospels by the original Greek, which his holy doctor executed to the great satisfaction of the whole church. He afterwards did the same with the rest of the New Testament. 
This work of St. Jerome differs very much in the word from the ancient Italic. It, it, it insensibly took place in all the Western churches and is in the Latin Vulgate of the New Testament, which is now everywhere in use. The addition of the Greek Septuagint, which was inserted in Origins Hexbala, being the most extant, exact extant St. Jerome corrected by it in the ancient Italic of many books of the Old Testament, and twice the Soster. Solster, first by order of Pope De, um, Demasis at Rome about the year 382, and a second time about the year uh, in Bethlehem in 389. I'm just going to have a break there, and I'm just going to put some um, music on, and then uh, just going to have a break for a few minutes. Just, just gonna have a break, uh, just for five minutes. Oh, <laughs> 
to the life of uh, St. Jerome in a moment, we'll just read a scripture and say a prayer, and uh, we'll continue uh, to look at the life of Jerome.
soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, which is satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy, thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord execute righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his way unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He had not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens is high above the earth, so great is the mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgression from us. Like as a father pity. On the place therein shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto the children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, and that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure, Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Just have a little bit more music, and then I'll close with a prayer, and then we'll go on concerning the life of St. Jerome, and then we'll look into what he thinks about the canon. <laughs>
Lord, as we go on with uh, Jerome Lord and we look at his life and his views on the canon, we pray that this would not just be intellectual, but Lord we would grow in the knowledge some more of St. Jerome. Butler writes, his new translation of the books of the Old Testament written in Hebrew made from the original text was a more noble and more difficult undertaking. Many motives concurred to engage him in this work as the earnest entreaties of many devout and illustrious friends. The preference of the original to any version how venerable soever and the necessity of answering the Jews who in all deputation would allow no other he did not translate the books in order but began by the books of kings and took the rest in hand at different times this translation of Saint Jerome was received in many churches at the time of Saint Gregory the Great who gave it the preference and in short time afterwards Saint Isidore of Seville wrote that all churches made you they retained the ancient Italic versions of the Psalms to which they were accustomed to sing in the Divine Office, but admitted by degrees in some places the first, in others the second correction of St. Jerome upon the seventy. This is printed in the Vulgate Bible, not his translation. The old Italic without his correction is still sung in the Church of the Vatican and St. Mark at Venice. The books of Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus, the two books of the Maccabees and the Prophecy of Baruch, the Epistle of Jeremy, the editions, at the end of Esther and the 13 and 14 chapters of Daniel and the Cantonil of the three children are in the ancient Vulgate because they were not translated by St. Jerome not being extant in the Hebrew or Chaldec. The rest of the Old Testament in the present Vulgate is taken from the translation of St. Jerome except certain passages retained from the Old Vulgate or Italic. St. Jerome's translation of the Bible was correctly published by Dom Martania under the title Sacred Library. This composes the first volume of his works in the De Benedictine edition. This saint ascertained the geographical description of the ancient Palatine by translating, correcting and enlarging Eusebius' book on the holy places and by his letters to Dan, Danus and, in, and Fabiolia. In several little treaties and epistles he has cleared a great number of critical difficulties relating to the Hebrew text of the Holy Bible. In his commentaries, his commentaries on the prophets, he inquires after the sense of Hebrew text, or truth as he called it, to which he scrupulously adheres, though he compares it with all the ancient Greek translations. He adds short allegorical explications and professes that he sometimes inserts certain opinions and interpretations of origin and others without adopting or approving them. His commentary on St. Matthew, he calls only an essay which he wrote in a compass of a few days, studies by an incursion of barbarians who penetrated through Egypt into Palestine and some time after by the violence and persecutions of the Pelagians who after the council of Dio Diosopolis in 1416 were lying on the protection of John of Jerusalem sent the year following a troop of seditious banditti to Bethlehem to assault the holy monks and nuns who lived there under the direction of Saint Jerome some were beaten and a deacon was killed by them. The heretic set fire to all the monasteries and reduced them to ashes. Saint Jerome with great difficulty escaped their fury by a timely flight, retiring to a strong castle. The two virgins, Saint Ananis, uh, Saint Eustichium and her niece, the younger Paulina, were exposed still to greater dangers and saw the habitation consumed with fire and those who belonged to them most barbarously beaten before the faces. After this storm St. Jerome continued his exercises and labours hated by all the enemies of the church but beloved and reverenced beloved and made his life sorry but beloved and reverenced by all good men 
St. Suplicius Servius and St. Austin testify, having triumphed over all vices, subdued the infernal monsters of heresies and made his life a martyrdom of penance and labours at length by a fever in a good old age. He is released from his prison of his body in the year 420 on the 30th of September. The festival is mentioned in the sacramentary of St. Gregory and in the martyologies of Bede, ushered, and he was buried in a vault at the ruins of the monastery of Bethlehem, but his remains lie at the present in the church of St. Mary Major at Rome. St. Jerome in my ears, arise you dead, and come to judgment. It was equally in the penance, spirit of penance and zeal to advance the divine honour that this holy doctor applied himself with such unwearied diligence to those sacred studies by which he rendered most eminent service to the church. The commentaries of the ancient fathers on the divine oracles are not equally useful. Allegorical interpretations, unless pointed out by some inspired writer, serve chiefly to convey that moral instruction which they contain and to introduce which they have been sometimes employed by great men in familiar discourses to, to the people. Of all commentaries, those are most useful which expand the mysteries of faith or dwell on and enforce Christian virtues by motives founded in the literal genuine sense of the sacred writings and which inspired words the perfect spirit, as it were, the marrow of all virtues is content. It is only by assiduous, humble meditation on the sacred text that its inexhausted riches in this respect, concealed in very little, can be understood. The admirable comments of St. Chrysostom will be an excellent guide and key by making some parts of them familiar to us. We will ensure ourselves to this method in our application to these sacred studies. We must bring with us that spirit of prayer and that humble docility facility by which so many holy doctors have been rendered faithful interpreters of the word of God. The tradition of the church must be our direction. Without a humble submission to this light, we are sure to be led astray, and the most learned, most learned men do not sit, stick close to this rule, as experience and more sacred authority conspire to teach us. Tread in the steps of all those who study the scriptures as hurt the church instead of serving it, as Dr. Hur, the learned bishop of Chichester, observes. So, we basically um, had a brief survey of Augustine, uh, Saint Jerome's life. Um, so we're just going to have a few minutes break. I'm just a bit tired. That's been about an hour's reading, um, and then we'll, we're going to read some extracts then of Saint Jerome's. Thoughts on the canon of scripture and that'll take about 20 minutes and then after that I'll give my own thoughts about what I think about St. Jerome and what we've read um, okay
I like to get uh, a historical survey before we get to specifics. It's good to just have a brief survey of the whole life of someone or a whole historical situation before you get to details. You'll notice when uh, I did debates with atheists, uh, I often gave uh, a historical survey of, su of a subject before I actually went into details. And I like to get a, it's always good to get a historical grasp of a situation before you actually get into detail. So the, that's why we looked at the life of Jerome before we actually looked at his views on the canon. <clears throat> so now in his preface, in Jerome's preface in the Book of Kings in AD 391, we get an idea in the canon and those are his views all right so Saint Jerome's prologue to the book to prologue to the books of the kings reads that the Hebrews of 22 letters is testified also by the Syrian and Chaldean languages which for the most part correspond to the Hebrew for they have 22 elementary sounds which are pronounced the same way but are differently written the Samaritans also write the Pentateuch of Moses with just the same number of letters, differing only in the shape and points of the letters. And it is certain that Esdras, the scribe, the teacher of the law, after the capture of Jerusalem and the restoration of the temple by Zerubbabel, invented other letters which we now use for up to that time the Samaritan and Hebrew characters were the same. In the book of Numbers, moreover, where we have the consensus of the Levites, priests, Numbers 3, uh, the 112th, the 119th, and the 145th, although they are written in different meters, are all composed as acrostics according to an alphabet of the same number of letters. The Lamentations of Jeremiah and his prayer, the Proverbs of Solomon also towards the end, from the place where we read who will find a steadfast woman, are instances of the same number of letters forming the division into sections. Furthermore, five are double letters, kaf, mef, nun, and fasad, for at the beginning and at the middle of the word they are written one way and at the same another way. When it happens that by most people five of the books are reckoned as double, Jeremiah with Kenoth, his lamentations, as then there are 22 elementary characters by means of which we write in Hebrew, all we say, and the human voices is comprehended within the limits. So we reckon 22. He goes on, the first of these books is called Beresith, to which we give the name Genesis. 
second Elusameth, which bears the name Exodus, the third by Assyria, that is Leviticus, and the fourth by Adaba, which we call Numbers, the fifth El Adarim, which is entitled Deuteronomy. These are the five books of Moses, which they properly call the Torah, Torah that is law. The second class is composed of the prophets, and they begin with Jesus, the son of Nave, which among them is called Joshua. Next is the series of Softim, that is the book of Judges, and in the same book they include Ruth because the events narrated occurred in the days of the Judges. Then comes Samuel, which is Excuse me, for the author does not scribe the kingdoms of many nations, but that of the one people, the people of Israel, which is comprised of the twelve tribes. The fifth is Isaiah, the sixth is Jeremiah, the seventh is Ezekiel, and the eighth is the book of the twelve prophets, <coughs> which is called among them Thar Azra. To the third class belong the Hagai, sorry, Hagaio Grapha of which the first book begins with Job, the second with David, whose writings are divided into five parts and comprise in one volume of Psalms, the third is Solomon, and the three books Proverbs, which they all par call the parables, that is Masaloth, Ecclesiastes, that is Coleth, the Song of Songs, which is they denote by the title Sir Asarim, the sixth is Daniel, the seventh um, is the Chronicles of the Hall of the Sacred History, and the Book of Monks, as is called first and second Parley, uh, par Parley, Pomenon, or Chronicles. The eighth is Ezra, which itself is likewise divided amongst Greeks and Latins into two books, and the ninth is Esther. And so there are also 22 books of the old law, that is, five of Moses, eight of the prophets, nine of the Hagrapha, though some include Ruth and Kinoth, Lamentations amongst the Hagiographa. Hag and think that these books ought to be reckoned separately. We should thus have 24 books of the ancient law, and these the Apocalypse of John represents by the 24 elders who adore the Lamb and offer their crowns and Lord visage while in their presence stand the four living creatures, the eyes before whom, before and behind, that is, looking to the past and the future, and with unwearied voice crying, Holy, Holy, Holy God Almighty, who was and is, will be. writings, wisdom therefore which generally bears the name of Solomon and the book of Jesus the son of Syriac and Judith Tobias and the shepherd of Hermes are not in the canon. The first book of Maccabees is found in Hebrew but the second is Greek as can be proved from the very style. Although these things are thus I beseech you my reader not to think that my labours are intended to disparage the ancients, the translators of the older versions for the service of the tabernacle of God, each one offers what he can, some gold and silver, precious stones and others linen and blue and purple and scarlet. We shall do well if we offer skins and goats and hair. Yet the apostle pronounces are more contentable things more necessary than others. 1 Corinthians 12.22 Accordingly, the beauty of the tabernacle as a whole in the several kinds and the ornaments of the church present and future was covered with skins and gold hair cloths. The heat of the sun and the injurious rain were warded off by those things were of less account. First read then my Samuel and Kings, mine I say mine, for whatever by diligent translation and by anxious amendation we have learnt and made our own is ours, and when you understand something of which you were before ignorant, reckon me a translator if you are grateful, or a paraphraser if ungrateful, although I am not at the least conscious of having deviated from Hebrew original. At all events, if you are incredulous, Read the Greek and Latin manuscripts and compare them with these poor efforts of mine. Wherever you see they disagree, ask some Hebrew in whom you can have more faith. And if he confirm our view, I suppose you will not think him a soothsayer and suppose that he and I have rendered the same passage divided, divined alike. But I ask you, handmaidens of Christ, who anoint the head of your reclining Lord, with the most precious mirth of faith, who by no means seek to save you in the tomb. 
for in Christ has long since ascended to the Father, I beg you to confront with the shield of your prayers the dogs who bark and rage against me with rabid mouths and who go about the city and think themselves learned if they disparage others. Now in my loneliness I will always remember that we are told, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I that I offend not in my tongue. I have set a guard upon my mouth while the sinner standeth against me. I become dumb and was humbled and kept silence from good words, Psalm 38, 2. So that's very clear, um, very, very clear that the Old Testament that we have is actually uh, confirmed by Jerome there. Um, next uh, passage uh, is called On Famous Men, Chapter 1 by uh, St. Jerome. He writes, St. Peter wrote two epistles which are called Catholic, the second of which, on account of its difference from the first in style, is considered by many not to be by him. Then to the gospel, according to Mark, who was his hearer and interpreter, he said to be his. On the other hand, the books of which one is entitled is Acts, and another is his gospel, a third is preaching, a fourth is revelation, a fifth is judgment, are reputed as apocryphal. It's interesting how Jerome here clearly knows what's apocryphal and not, and he's basically saying that 1 and 2 Peter are actually the word of God. I think that's quite profound, really. He goes in in a letter to Hedapia in AD 1... Sorry, um, a letter to Hedabia, sorry. He writes, Thus Paul had Titus as an interpreter, just as the blessed Peter also had Mark, whose gospel... That's really good. I think that's awesome that uh, he's saying why there are differences in Greek concerning Peter 1 and 2 Peter. Uh, very, very amazing stuff this, I think. Absolutely amazing. AD 394. The New Testament I will briefly deal with. Now, that's interesting. The New Testament. This is in 394, a letter to Paulinus, Bishop of Nola. So in 394, there is clearly an understanding of what the New Testament is. The New Testament, I will briefly deal with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are the Lord's team of four. The true cherubim, the store of knowledge. With them, the whole body is full of eyes. They glitter as sparks. They run and return like lightning. Their feet are straight feet and lighted up. Their backs also are winged, ready to fly in all directions. generally counted in with the others. He instructs Timothy and Titus, he intercedes with Philemon for his runaway slave of him. I think it better to say nothing than to write inadequately. The Acts of the Apostles seems to relate to a mere unvarnished narrative descriptive of the infancy of the newly born church. But once, once we realize that their author is Luke the physician, his praise is in the gospel. We shall see that all his words are medicine for the sick soul. The apostle James, Peter, and J John, and Jude have published seven epistles at once, spiritual and to the point. Short and long, short that is in word, but lengthy in substance, so that there are few indeed who do not find themselves in the dark. When they read them, the apocalypse of John has as many mysteries as words. In saying this, I have said less than and the book deserves all praise of it is inadequate manifold meanings lie hid in its very word I beg you my dear brother to live among these books to meditate upon them to know nothing else to seek nothing else AD the letter to Dardanus prefect of Gaul uh, AD 414 the B. F. Westcott a general survey of the history of the canon of the New Testament um, 1881. In fact, that would be a good book to actually 
get hold of actually just bear with me I want to just make sure I get this down because uh, that just looks a really good book to get hold of I see I I can get it on here. Be a really good book to read that. To get all of it. Just looking for that. Yeah, that'll be another day. That'll be another day to look at Westcott. Anyhow, um, the letter to Darnanus, Prefect of Gaul, AD 414, but in B.B. Westcott, A General Survey of the History of the Canon of the New Testament, 1881, page 452. You read, we read this, the very, this very clear and important passage shows that when Jerome speaks of the epistle to the Hebrews as not reckoned among St. Paul's in his letter to Paulinus, 394 AD, we must suppose that the doubt applies to the authorship and not to the canicity of the writing. The distinct and decisive reference to ancient and constant testimony for the two disputed books deserves careful attention. Westcott. This must be said to our, to our people that the epistle which is entitled to the Hebrews is accepted as the Apostle Paul's not only by the churches of the East but all the church writers in the Greek languages of earlier times, although many judge it to be by Barnabas or by Clement. It is of no great moment who the author is, since it is the work of a churchman and receives recognition day by day in the public reading of the churches. If the custom of the Latins does not receive it among the canonical scriptures, neither by the same liberty do the churches of the Greeks except John's Apocalypse, yet we accept them both not following the custom of the present time, but the president of early writers who generally make free use of the testimonies from both works. And this they do not as they are wont on occasion to quote from apocryphal writings, as indeed they use examples from pagan literature, but treating them as can canonical and churchly works. So Jerome is quite clear there that there is um, There is a list of there is an actual list of canonical books that he sees as a scripture. Um, I'm just writing this down because it's very important. Uh, www dot So there we are. That's uh, that's so there we are. That that's uh, Jerome's list. Um, Um, we'll just listen to some music and I'll just get back to you in a minute I just want to get 
some more information and then we'll close on this one. Thank you. 
Uh, a few more minutes I'm just uh, looking at an article that is really helpful um.
St. Jerome and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go right through all the various lists of the New Testament in ancient times and see what we learn from that as we think about Jerome and the canon okay okay uh, the moratorium fragment uh, was about AD 170 uh, the moratorium fragment is the oldest known list of the New Testament books it was discovered by Lodvico Antonio Matori in a manuscript in the Ambrosian Library in Milan and published by him in 1740. It is called a fragment because the beginning of it is missing. Although the manuscript in which it appears was copied during the 7th century, the list itself is dated to about 170 because its author refers to the Episcopate of Pius I of Rome who died in 157 as recent. He mentions only two epistles of John without describing them. The Apocalypse of Peter is mentioned as a book which some of us were not allowed to be read in church. A very helpful and detailed discussion of this document is to be found in uh, Bruce Metz's The Canon of the New Testament, Oxford. Um, okay, so let's read uh, the Moratorium Fragment. The following translation usually follows the amended text edited by Hans Leitman um, in his uh, Das Morat Icht Fragment und die Monarch Nichten Prolog zund den Evangelen Text Bonn, 1902, Berlin, 1933. Owing to the wretched state of the Latin text, it's sometimes difficult to know what the writer intended, several phrases therefore are provided with alternative renderings enclosed within the parenthesis. Translational expansions are enclosed within the square brackets. The numerals indicate the line of the original text. For a discussion, see chapters 8, 1 above where freer renderings are sometimes given. Uh, so here's the moratorium fragment, okay? Uh, 
uh, right about AD 170. At which nevertheless he was present and so he placed them in his narrative. I'll see who that was. Could be that means Mark. The, at which nevertheless he was present and so he placed them in his narrative. The third book of the gospel is that according to Luke. Luke the well-known physician after the extension of Christ when Paul had taken with him as one zealous for the law composed it in his own name according to the general belief yet he himself had not seen the Lord in the flesh and therefore as he was able to ascertain events so indeed he begins to tell the story from the birth of John the fourth of the Gospels is that of John of the disciples to his fellow disciples and bishops who had been urging him to write he said fast with me for today three days and what will be revealed to each one let us tell it to one another. The same side it was revealed to Andrew, one of the apostles, that John should write down all things in his own name, and while all of them should revealed and so. Though various elements may be taught in the individual books of the Gospels, nevertheless this makes no difference to the faith of believers, since by one sovereign spirit all things have been declared in all the Gospels, concerning the nativity, concerning the passion, concerning the resurrection, concerning life with his disciples and concerning his twofold coming the first in loneliness when he was despised which has taken place the second glorious in royal power which is still in the future what marvel is it then if John so consistently mentions these particular points also in his epistle saying about himself what we have seen with our eyes and heard with our ears and our hands and have handled these things we have written to you for in this way he professes himself to be not only an eyewitness and hearer, but also a writer of all the marvellous deeds of the Lord in the order. Moreover, the acts of all the apostles were written in one book. But for most excellent Theophilus, Luke compiled the individual events that took place in his presence, as he plainly shows by omitting the martyrdom of Peter, as well as the departure of Paul from the city of Rome. When he journeyed to Spain, as for the epistles, Paul they themselves make clear to those desiring to understand which ones they are, from what place or from what reason they were sent. First of all, to the Corinthians, prohibiting the heretical schisms. Next, to the Galatians, against uh, circumcision. Then, to the Romans, he wrote at length, explaining the order or plan of the scriptures and also that Christ is their principle. It is necessary for us to discuss these one by one since the blessed Apostle Paul himself followed the example of his predecessor John writes by name to only seven churches in the following sequence to the Corinthians first to the Ephesians second to the Philippians third to the Colossians fourth Galatians fifth Thessalonians six to the Romans seventh it is true that he writes once more to the Corinthians and to the Thessalonians for the sake of our admonition yet it is clearly recognizable that there is one church spread throughout the whole extent of the earth for John also in the Apocalypse though he writes to seven churches nevertheless speaks to all Paul also wrote out of affection and love one to Philemon to Titus and to two, <clears throat> Timothy these are held sacred in the esteem of the church Catholic for the regulation of the ecclesiastical discipline there is a current also an epistle to the Laodiceans and another to the Alexandrians, both forged in Paul's name to further the heresy of Marcion and several, several others, which cannot be received into the Catholic Church, for it is not fitting that gold be mixed with honey. Moreover, the epistle of Jude, to God mentioned, bearing the name of John, I counted or used to the Catholic Church, and the Book of Wisdom written by the friends of Solomon in his honour. We receive only the apocalypses of John and Peter, though some of us are not willing the later be read in the church. But Hermes wrote the shepherd very recently in our times in the city of Rome, while Bishop Pius, his brother, was accompanying Episcopal chair of the church of the city of Rome. And therefore it indeed to be read, but it cannot be read publicly to the people in the church, either among the prophets whose number is complete, or among the apostles, for it is after their time. But we accept nothing what of 
Arsenius or Valentius or Melitates, who also composed a new book of Psalms for Marcion, together with Balisates, the ancient founder of the Cataphragians. What do I make of this uh, moratorium fragment? Um, I think what's very, very clear um, there is there's already a clear understanding of what the canon is. It's very clear, even though not all the New Testament books are mentioned there, it's very, very clear that the canon was the prophets and the apostles. That's very, very clear there. Uh, and yeah, uh, some of the church fathers were quoting other new, uh, books that were not in the New Testament, but it's very clear from this moratorium fragment that they knew quite clearly what was scripture and what was not, that what was scripture is what was attributed to the apostles, what was not scripture was, was not according to what the apostles were about. So it's very, very clear to me um, that when I met the Muslim the other day who said that in the Council of Nicaea there was this deliberation and trying to work out from 400 texts that that was completely erroneous. Um, and we've gone into a study in Jerome because I found a little quotation where he talks about an apocryphal book of scripture and that's led us on to uh, a wider study of St. Jerome which clearly shows he clearly knew what scripture and what was not and going back now uh, to the moratorium fragment which is AD 170 my mind is completely at peace now to know that there's absolute clear evidence that from the moratorium fragment alone that they absolutely knew what scripture was. Scripture was that which was apostolic, that had a, the apostolic seal and they were aware of people trying to pretend uh, to be apostles, pretending to have apostolic authority and they were very aware of these kind of forgeries going on uh, and that's very very clear in this moratorium fragment. So, studying Jerome, uh, what's, what I've got from studying Jerome, and, and so when you look at Jerome's, when he quote, he actually quotes Apocrypha texts. Now it's very clear, um, Jerome in his comments about uh, the canon, it's very, very clear, he knew what the canon was, he knew what the Old Testament was, he knew what New Testament was. He knew. But when you look at his writings and his preface, <clears throat> you'll find that he actually quotes the Apocrypha when he, he says the Apocrypha is not scripture. Um, what that shows you is that the early church did respect many of these apocryphal kind of writings that that were the Jews respected but did not put in the canon and and stuff like that. They respected them and they quoted them as part of um, ecclesiastical um, that the Apocrypha was not scripture. Absolutely clear, there's no argument against that. Now, if any Catholic apologist or anybody says Jerome changed his mind later, well, I beg to differ. But the point that I want to get over is this, that when we read the New Testament and there are all these arguments going around about the New Testament, there was a conspiracy by the early church to keep out loads of written texts. 
the answer to that is very clear that there was an apostolic succession that the church chose the text that belonged to the apostles or had something related to the apostles had some kind of authority to the apostles and that's the issue so there we are so I'm